here to talk about 1968 and Hugh, Hugh Goff's um, experiences and um, memories of his time in, in Paris in May of 1968. So what I thought I might do is I might start off a few questions um, to, to ease, ease into it a wee bit and then maybe open it up to, to the floor. Um, and expecting this to last about 40, 45 minutes um, and, and hopefully you know, we'll, we'll be able to get... Um, so if you do have a question, just do stick up your hand and I'll, I'll try to get to people. So first of all, I thought it might be good if you give us a little bit of background to how did you come to be in, in Paris in May and June of 1968? Well, it was by accident, really, because I, was, um, I did my degree in Oxford in history. And um, when I finished, um, I thought, you know, this is a bit inbred. So I went and worked in industry for a couple of years. And then I realised industry was awful, um, because the company I worked with, British Petroleum, was, it was a good company, but you had to wear a suit in the head office every day, and there were all sorts of constraints, which I found very difficult. So I went back to Oxford to do a, a, a PhD, um, and I'd only ever really had one interesting lecturer while I was in Oxford, who was an unusual historian, completely chaotic, but uh, totally inspirational. And he specialised in French history. So when I went back, I wanted to do French history. And so he said, well, if you, if you want to do French history, you have to go to France. Well, I couldn't because it was the football season until April, uh, and I was a, quite a good goalkeeper. So I had to stay in Oxford until the April, uh, late April of 1968. And then eventually I went to France um, on the 5th of May, 1968, uh, to do archival research. Um, and what happened the day after I arrived meant that the archives were closed for the next month anyway, because uh, the whole thing erupted in flames. Um, when I arrived there. So that's what landed me as a rather naive um, Englishman um, with pretty good French, uh, but uh, totally new to the situation I encountered when I got there. That's how I landed at the Gare Saint-Lazare, because in those days you didn't take the plane. You couldn't afford to. Um, you took the train, and you took the overnight ferry, and you arrived at uh, five in the morning. Uh, not really pleasant for anybody to see or to smell. Um, and, and is there any kind of specific events or, or people that you remember meeting and, and, you know, in those kind of two months that, um, you know, that kind of stand out for you? Well, really, at the, at the beginning, I was totally alone because in those days, there were no social media, there was no Twitter, there, thank goodness, there was no Facebook uh, and there were no mobile phones in France. I mean, the French phones were, were awful anyway uh, as well. It was very difficult to telephone anybody in those days. So, um, really, you were largely on your own, but... Um, I began, uh, for the first three or four days, I just got a hotel on the left bank and then the whole thing erupted around me. And then I had friends who I contacted who lived in the Cité Universitaire. Now, I don't know if you know the Cité Universitaire, but it's a, it's a campus to the south of Paris in which all, all the major countries have their own um, student hostel or student house. And there are some magnificent ones there. There's a Le Corbusier there, and there are some uh, beautifully built... Um, Places and there's a, a common restaurant. So what happened was that I hit the Cité Universitaire about the 10th or the 11th of May, I think. The 10th of May was one of the big demos. Um, and then you found yourself in the middle of what was taking place within a microcosm within Paris because all the separate houses then had their own student revolutions on the, on the campus where we were, um, except my own. I was in the German one, and that was very disciplined. Um, we didn't have any problems there, but the, the, the city universitaire. So uh, there were a lot of foreign students there who were, again, fascinating to meet. Um, what was your experience of student politics before? Almost none. Um, student politics never really interested me. Um, national politics did. I was a committed member or uh, supporter of the Labour Party um, in England. Uh, but student politics, in Oxford, student politics were, you know, they, they were there, but they didn't particularly interest me. So was there anything that you were reading at the time or, or you know, um, that kind of informed any of your opinions or ideas about France or about May 68? Or I, think that, I think probably what um, struck me when I got there, I knew my French history reasonably well by the time I got there. Not as well as I do now, but at my age you probably forget more than you learn too. But um, in those days I, I knew my French history very well and what struck me was um, almost immediately... There are two things, really. First of all, that the French know how to do demonstrations and they know how to organise these things. I mean, there is a kind of, uh, there's a kind of culture which is not in the blood, stupid, it's, it's more in the folk memory. Um, and in particular, student uh, rebellion and student revolt uh, has a, a longish history in France, so there was that culture that was there. 
um, I suppose. And the second thing was, and we were mentioning this before um, we began talking, um, I was struck by the, as the thing un unfolded, by the parallels with 1936. It was a big, um, uh, the popular front, the uh, events of 1936 in which the left gained power for the first time in France, or the Socialist Party did, and uh, the pattern of street protest, in particular of factory occupations, which was the second phase of the student revolt in France, because you're dealing not just with the student revolt, but, but a much wider social revolt. That struck me as um, a, a parallel, which you, know, you began then to read it through your historical knowledge. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in is this idea of a, a generation and, you know, the 68 generation. And obviously there's a kind of global idea about the student movement and student activism. Now, you weren't a student at the time, but you were, you know... I was pretty young. Yeah, you, so you were, you were still young. Yeah. yeah, but did you see yourself as part of that generation? And, you know, what kinds of... Yeah, I did. I mean, I think the thing about the generation is that what was happening in the late 60s was that the whole baby boomer generation, um, and, you know, I was born in 1944, so I was 24 in 1968, and the other people would have been born, you know, a lot of the activists between 1944 and, say, 1950, 1952. And this was a generation, we were a generation that hadn't really known the austerity of the post-war period, and the 1960s had seen the growth of economic expansion and also the, the collapsing of cultural norms, uh, with the collapse of the old-fashioned approach to morality, what you could say in public, and uh, the growth of satire, uh, the explosion of pop music, obviously, um, those kinds of things, the existence of the transistor radio, um, all these kinds of things meant that there was a generational shift taking place and that, in a way, we had a culture which was more different than our parents than I think would have happened to children 10 years earlier. And so there was that shift that was going on, and I think there were several other things that were going on in the background that conditioned the way in which people looked at things um, without any sense of priority in, in listing them. First of all, there was the Vietnam War. Um, Johnson stopped bombing Vietnam, I think, um, in um, October of 68. So this 67, 68, the bombing of uh, Vietnam was taking place. And the French events started off with a Vietnam protest committee. That's, that's the long fuse which starts the thing off. Um, Anti-American protests were taking place in London. There was the big Grosvenor Square rallies in London. I wasn't in London at the time. It was in March or April, I think. And then there was the, um, the protests in Germany, Japan. So you have a kind of troubled political background there. Another element was the, um, the and this was the paradoxical one, that uh, we were a generation which was richer than the youth that had preceded us. And yet, in a way, in 1968, there was this protest against consumerism. There was a, 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 an attack on consumerism and the boringness of consumer lives. Um, Marcuse is partly responsible for this. Um, this belief that there was more to life than just working in a factory and getting your living and buying your car, um, which was paradoxical because, uh, in a way, it was a generation that was very lucky to, to have economic resources that um, generations before it hadn't had, and yet we didn't have the intelligence probably to see that um, at the time. So the political thing of America, the surge of youth, remember that in France there were 170,000 students in 1960, there are 530,000 students by 1968. There was also a thing in France which wasn't true in England and was less true elsewhere of a totally hopeless university system, which was wholly overloaded um, and completely remote and dominated by a hierarchical professorial system rather like UCD had in those days um, where professors were gods and everybody else served the professors um, including Paddy and myself in those days. Uh, when you joined the university in UCD in those days you weren't called a lecturer, you were called an assistant. Um, you were assistant to the professor um, and the French system was very, very similar. And so uh, in, um, in universities in France, there was no contact with the staff at all. And it was a very remote system. And so as a result, uh, there was a rebellion against the system, which in England didn't take place because there was a very good staff-student ratio. Um, and to a certain extent in Ireland, the staff-student ratio wasn't bad. Not as bad as it is now. Anyway. Yeah. Um, one of the, the other things, I mean, you talked about the, the differences between your generation and the previous generation. Um, and one of the, you know, with these kind of generational shifts, there's usually a conflict in particular with the previous generation. So, I mean, 
apart from those things that you mentioned, is there anything that you, you know, were you in direct conflict with the previous generation about? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, it's a long time ago. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, in a way, I came from a culture in England. Um, England really began to fall apart in the 1970s uh, uh, with the, um, the, the oil crisis and the industrial crises and the uh, mining crisis, all these sort of things. In the way, England in the 1960s was on the crest of a wave because culturally England was, um, was doing extremely well. I mean, this sounds trivial, but with um, pop music, um, there was a kind of optimism in the air and in fashion. Uh, the advent of the Labour government in 64, which was a bit of a fiasco in retrospect, but at the time, you know, it seemed to be a good thing. So, um, in a way, it seemed to me that in England the, the um, transition of generations was running more easily than in France. You see, the problem in France, I think, is partly related to the fact that France had had a problem with Algeria, which is an understatement, the uh, Algerian War, which had involved a, an awful lot of French young people as uh, recruits, and uh, that had come to an end in 1962. Uh, and it was ended by the genius of de Gaulle. I mean, de Gaulle was a highly intelligent political operator. But by the late 60s, de Gaulle was now an old man. He was sort of well into his 70s. And in a way, the political system in France was much more stagnant and much more uh, remote. And in a way, as, as Le Monde, I think it's on the 1st of January 1968, I, mean, I could be contradicted here, had an editorial on the state of the country, La France sans nuit, um, France is getting bored. Um, which is a throwback uh, to 1848. I mean, the French are very good on the historical parallels. Um, when Lamartine, I think it was, said uh, La France s'ennuie, and there was a revolution that happened afterwards. So um, there, was a, there was an element of political stagnation going on in France, um, which wasn't the case, for example, in America, where, I mean, after all, there was an American presidential campaign going on, which was highly active um, in 1968, with Robert Kennedy shot dead and uh, uh, the Chicago riots in August. Um, France, uh, until May, was politically stagnant, and yet nobody could see what was coming. Sarah, you, you, you brought up particularly the whole idea of generational conflict as being uh, something that just struck me here that as, you, as you were talking there. The historical parallels with the other one. Was there any sense that... Was there a generation that, that let's say, the generation of 68 looked back to in all, was it the, was it the revolutionary generation of 1848? Was it um, you know you know who were their who were their great historical heroes? Can I say just one thing before I before I tackle that? I can it, it, what, there was a generational issue going on. Yeah, I remember on the sixth of May when there was a big student protest, and it ended up with uh, an enormous battle on the Boulevard Saint Germain, um, and. You know, as an innocent Englishman as I was, uh, I'd never seen anything on that scale before. Because in those days, nearly all the main streets in Paris were cobblestones, and, and people just levered up the cobblestones and hurled them at the police. Um, and there were over 400 people injured that day, badly injured, um, with the, the, the stone thrown that was going on. And I'd never seen a water cannon before. Um, uh, if you get wet from a water cannon, you really get very wet. And if you're close to it, you get knocked over. And there was a pitch battle going on on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, and there was a, a fellow, he was in his 50s, next to me, and he was cheering it on. Uh, and he said, the buggers deserve it, the buggers deserve it. Um, so, you know, even men in their 40s and 50s didn't like the police and the CRS in particular. Although I have some sympathy with the CRS, having met a couple. Um, but to, to, um, to go, what was your original question now? I think the historical. I think the, actually, I think the, there was a historical consciousness that this was like 1848 because 1848 was the springtime of the peoples on the European scale, and to some extent, what was going on was a European-wide protest movement of sorts. And so there was a kind of optimism in the air, which which fed back to the ideas of 1848. The commune, the Paris Commune of 1871, wasn't used as much. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but in a way, I think what was in people's minds more then was actually uh, Mao's China, uh, Vietnam. Um, after all, uh, the, what was happening in the 1960s in France and Europe as a whole was that the, the, the hold of Marxism on the French left was collapsing because of the Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin, the awareness of what uh, the atrocities that Stalin had committed, and the beginning of the long iron, I mean, Khrushchev had fallen in 64, and you've got Brezhnev, you've got these uh, old-fashioned party hacks which are running the system. 
And so there is a, a move uh, towards alternatives within the left. I mean, a couple of people that I knew were ardent Trotskyites. Um, and I did try to read Trotsky, but I, I didn't get very far. But um, Trotsky as an alternative to Stalinism, more a philosophy of action and of, of class warfare, whereas Stalinism is a more machine-oriented um, uh, communism. Also Ho Chi Minh, because this appealed to the kind of anti-consumerism element in the 68 riots. Raising goats in the Ardèche was one of the, the, the sort of um, cliches that people talked about in 1968, just go away into the countryside and do your own thing. And a lot of people did um, in the Ardèche. Um, but there was a, an admiration of Ho Chi Minh and of Mao. You see, you didn't know what Mao was doing very well then, um, but this was the period of the Great Leap Forward, which was catastrophic um, in the end. And uh, an admiration, if you like, of third world um, possibilities, Che Guevara um, as well. So I think those parallels were as important as the historical parallel parallels for most French people. Is that fair enough, I think? Yeah. Yeah. I can begin to see a parallel now with the thinking we had in the 60s in the left Republican trend, because um, um, and, and, and some of us had evolved and then distanced ourselves from what you might call the Stalin tradition. Yeah. And we wanted the Republican movement to rediscover Marx via Connolly. Mm. And we were kind of attempting to do a, a neo Marxist analysis that led to an understanding of the national question in Ireland and the need to uncouple the way. That uh, the uh, um, by imposing the partition, the British had left the Irish in a mess. Yes. And we had a hand in the establishment of the the, uh, uh, the NICRA, civil rights movement in the north, mm. and the establishment of the Republican clubs in the north as a as a distinct mode of action for those who had been the IRA. Yeah. Because we wanted to go politically. Yeah. Now, that was all happening, and it was in parallel with what was going on in France. Mm. But we were looking at our own history. Yeah. And it, it, I, I, I see now more um, the link with the thinking in France than I saw um, I, 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 this morning and yesterday because of what you just said now. Mm. I hadn't realized that the the French thing was um, had a strong historical roots in the way you suggested. Oh, they do revolutions I, 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 at the <laughs> turn of a hat. You know? <laughs> I just had the impression it, 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 it was sort of a, it, it was um, um, it, it was extreme left posturing and mm. it didn't really have any local roots, but it has obviously. Oh, there were extreme left. Um, but but turning to the thing is, Lenin. Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky, all that area is an overlay of Marx, and Marx needs to be rediscovered and, uh, and updated to the current situation. Well, when I came to Dublin, there were two Marxist bookshops. Um, there was one in Townsend Street, and, and there was another one. There was a Maoist one, and then there was a sort of Orthodox Leninist one. Um, so it would have been uh, uh, the original uh, new books with John Nolan in it yeah. was the old Communist Party, Communist okay. bookshop. There was also a Trotsky's bookshop, and there was also a Maoist bookshop. Was that it, yeah. Yes. yeah. And now it's Hodge Figgis. Take a question from Matt, then Darren, then here. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in, in the experience. I want you to kind of hang about about the, the common studies. But I just wonder, when people talk to you about 68, what comes into your mind in terms of feeling, in terms of visually? Do you get put on the spot for anecdotes? What's your anecdotes? <laughs> um, yeah, um, feeling is the smell of tear gas, which was everywhere. Uh, feeling of disbelief that this was almost a film set, what was taking place. Um, cars overturned, set on fire, uh, grids ripped up from trees and set up in barricades. I mean, barricades hadn't been used in France. They'd been used in Algeria, but they hadn't been used in France since uh, 1827. Um, Oh, sorry, 1871 with the Paris Commune. But, it, you know, it's, it's um, to see that visually in the streets and also the feeling which is the obvious one, and it's a bit of a platitude, that anything could happen, I think. 
that nobody knew what would happen because in a way this wasn't, this wasn't a planned revolution and politics wasn't heart of the issue really. Um, politics, there were no real student ideas on politics. They wanted to change everything but it wasn't related to the actual political system. And then when the workers came out, as you know, they come out despite the unions, really. So all the structures were sort of thrown, thrown into doubt. And so you were aware that you were in a narrative to which there was no known end. Um, now I'm older, I realise that these things never work, and you could probably foresee the end, <laughs> you know, which is the biggest right-wing landslide of, of uh, modern French history. But, but um, that, that, that took a while. I had an interlude, you see. I left France... I had an interview here for a job. It wasn't meant to be here, but I got a phone call from my supervisor. It was Telegram. You had Telegrams in those days. It said, come back, Warwick interview. <laughs> so I had to... <laughs> so <laughs> I had an interview in Warwick, and, and you couldn't get out because by the 20th, everything was on strike. Nothing was moving uh, at all, except that you could get a bus to Beauvais, which in those days was, a, was an old uh, field airport with a grass runway, and I took off and I got into Lyd in Sussex. Uh, and I got to Oxford and I said, uh, how do I get to Warwick? And he said, well, there's a job in Dublin as well. If you want, have a go at that. And I'd worked in Belfast for a year and I said, well, I, I quite enjoy that. So I went to Dublin. And, you know, this is honestly true. And it reflects on me badly, but I was the only one who stayed for a drink afterwards. So I got the job. <laughs> um, that was in May 68. <laughs> And then when I got the job, I then went back um, to UK and I got back to France on about the 26th of... Um, of uh, so I had a little hiatus. Um, and at that stage, by the 26th of May, um, the whole political system was in meltdown. And, and that, that was... I think it was the feeling of being in a void and not knowing what was going to happen. And I have to admit one thing, and that is that because it wasn't my country, I didn't feel hugely invested in the thing. I, I really was a foreigner living in a bubble um, in that respect. Um, before Darren comes in, can I just come in on, on, on one part of that? Is that you know you talked about the disbelief and the feeling that you were in a void. When everything kind of you know ended in June of nineteen uh, of nineteen sixty eight, were you kind of disappointed? Did you feel as though the, there was you know a missed opportunity there? You know? No, I don't think so because I mean the thing about sixty eight was that there was never really a defined end. You know, it was very difficult to see what any any. Uh, byproduct will be. The politicians tried to seize the initiative at the end of the month when um, Mitterrand um, uh, said that he would, he would, um, he would be a, a, the next president. And Mondes France, who, who was a man of tremendous political respect in France, um, also volunteered to become part of the transitional takeover to, to sort of move out de Gaulle. Um, and yet that never really seemed uh, to be on the cards, as a, I don't think. In, well, I didn't feel that it was at the time. Um, there was a disappointment that it was over because it was a kind of carnival. You know, there was, a, there was an element of... You see, nobody sh got shot. Nobody got... Well, there was one, wor one person killed in, a, in, a, in a, 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 a confrontation with police at the Renault factory at Flan. But I don't think there was anybody else killed. It wasn't like here in the 70s where people shot each other and blew each other up. It, this was relatively civilised. Um, a lot of people injured. I didn't mean to see... I, I, the CRS are formidable anti-riot police, um, and they were very tough in the late 60s because they'd been trained in the Algerian disturbances of the early 60s, and they were ferocious. Uh, they really were. I mean, you could, uh, I remember standing on the Boulevard Saint-Michel and seeing people being really hammered uh, with truncheons, uh, really hammered. And I met one about 10 years later, in a campsite in Grenoble, a spa campsite, and uh, uh, I realised, you know, behind the uniform, they were frightened. They were absolutely frightened um, and scared. Um, don't think that excuses what they did, but you know, there are humans everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, really. Um, um, my question was actually quite similar to Matt, and therefore the answer would probably be quite short. Um, how did you feel? Were you scared? Were you no, scared? never, never scared, never scared. I felt um, privileged in a funny way that here I was a foreigner seeing somebody else sort themselves out. It wasn't my affair, um, but uh, I was seeing a street carnival and street affairs on a scale that, I, that I'd never seen before. Once or twice, yeah. I mean, you, you, you had to take shelter sometimes from a police run because, you know, you'd be watching it. All of a sudden, there was a stampede of the CRS towards you. You had to find a metro station down. So then they threw the tear gas down. So, you know, you're a bit frightened then, but never seriously threatened. Thank mm -hmm. you.
in the tradition of the leaving search questions, uh, could I ask you, compare and contrast <laughs> May 68 and Dublin 68-69? Uh, they're very different because I, I think the UC, UCD had its so-called gentle revolution. And it was gentle, but, and I don't think it was a revolution, but it was, it, it was an enjoyable kind of student sit-in and uh, student paralysis of uh, UCD. In uh, I think it must have been March, April, wasn't it? Sixty nine. Um, uh, yeah, like it, it had been building up over the beginning of, of 68, 69, yeah. and then, yeah. then came to a head in well, more January, the first phase of it, yeah, the yeah. and so on. And it was really caused by local uh, university things uh, about there were, there were arguments over the move to Belfield. And then there were there was rather like France. There was a division between the junior and the senior staff over the fact that the whole place was sort of run from, on a top-down system. Um, there was a feeling in the in Earthford Terrace there, where it all took place, or as far as I was concerned, it all took place. Again, a kind of feeling of uh, euphoria and a feeling that you could reinvent the world. I remember meeting some students who were absolutely amazed that they could sort of talk to professors who they found uh, were. You know, some of them very sympathetic towards them. So there was a kind of crossing of the generations, really, in that. It was much more gentle here because, you see, in those days there were a lot of clerical students for a start, and they weren't particularly, although Sister Benvenuta, my colleague in the history department, who was a Dominican nun, was very radical. She was heavily involved in it. But on the whole, um, it was a much more clerical student population and a much more deferential population here than in France, I think. I think on the whole, the strength of family in Ireland was such that the conflict of generations was not as evident here um, by, a, by a long way. Really, it was a, a, a kind of revolt over certain specific things to do with the move to Belfield. I think I'm right there, aren't I? And also um, just general staff-student um, relationships within the university as a whole. So, Can I follow up on that? Yeah. And there was some concern with the, tradition, the situation in the north. Yeah, they're probably right. Probably was, yeah. Because Burn Tollett was when? April 16th? I mean, there was January 16th. January 16th. There was yeah. mass meetings about the situation in the North. Yeah. The students. Yeah. With respect, I, I don't think there was anything to do with the North in the UCD no. revolution. I mean, in, in fact, there is a difference in a sense in that I think it was a group of students who had planned the revolution in the UCD. A uh, group of primarily philosophy students and history students tried to take it over subsequently. Uh, <laughs> has to, has to have <laughs> and they produced pamphlets and and, and and then they came on an issue which was just a make-believe issue where it was the fact that UCD was moving out from Arts and Terrace to Belfield and it was the question whether there would be a library in Belfield for our mm -hmm. students and that was the, the specific issue that uh, they uh, based their city in on and so on but but then subsequently, I was just saying to Matt before lunch there, that in a sense the revolution was uh, taken over by moderates, uh, led by, from the, from the back room by Garrett Fitzgerald and, and mm. his good Fine Gael colleagues. And, <laughs> and, uh, so, so, I mean, there were differences, but it was gentle and it was pleasant. And I'm speaking as a young staff member at the time, it was the most exciting time when I, <laughs> you know, I realised you could talk to students. And, and Actually, uh, one of the people involved, Paddy, was uh, Philip Pettit, who's one of the world's leading philosophers now. Um, in, uh, well, he's New York from Princeton. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. <laughs> 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 Just a, a comment, really, or a point of comparison I was on the previous panel with yeah. that. Uh, witnessing the things that I'm witnessing the East uh, in 2011, there's a couple of things I can readily identify with. First is that, that sense of privilege, mm. uh, uh, a deeply, deeply respectful privilege, which is wow, I've got the opportunity to witness that. The other is this feeling of, uh, I just turned 50, so I was in cynical middle age. The other is that, 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 that nevertheless, despite all that, there's that words worthy and, you know, what it is to be alive and to be young is very bliss and all that. Mm. And all this sort of left wing stuff that I'm, from my youth, that I thought, oh, well, that never going to happen. But oh my God, it's happening right before my eyes. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, which really shocked me. Uh, that I would almost go back in time. 30 years of my life, I was, I was young again, just to, just to be, in a sense, be part of this. Uh, the other thing I'd say I got from it was this, what I would call this sense of revolutionary time, that, that I felt it didn't 
actually matter what come afterwards. You know, mm. the linear time of history, and almost as if it were at that moment had been suspended, and mm. you're living in that moment that's pregnant with possibility. And you know well that things can likely to turn very, very nasty, certainly very, very unpredictable. But it was that feeling of, uh, almost an existential feeling. This is, this, is, this, is, this is one of the things when I draw my last breath. This is one of the things that I'll remember. It's one of the things that defined me. Uh, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering, is there any way of carrying on that feeling of, of revolutionary, non-linear time uh, uh, into into contemporary struggles. Because what we tend to do is to default to history and once something's historic it's past. Yeah, so history has lots of um, ways of resolving a situation, I suppose, yeah. I mean, I don't, unless you want to go into Trotsky's permanent revolution. Um, um, I remember one incident, though. When, when I got back, uh, and one of the things that stuck in my mind, I don't know the exact date now, but there was, I think it was the 28th or the 29th, when de Gaulle vanished, um, and he went off radar, uh, he was on the floor, really, in political terms, uh, and it looked as though he was about to fall. And then the news came out, and it came initially on the radio, I heard it first in a cafe, that he'd vanished. And he had vanished, he'd, um, you probably know the detail, he'd, he'd um, got helicopter, three helicopters in, and he'd gone away. And he didn't even tell his prime minister. And he cancelled the cabinet meeting and, and, and vanished. And nobody knew where he was going. They presumed he was going to Colombie les, les, les Deux Églises, where he, he had his base, and that he was going to write a speech of resignation. Nobody knew. But in fact, he didn't go to Colombie. He went. He crossed the, the Rhine into the French army um, base in, in the Rhineland um, and consulted with the uh, paratroop general, Jacques Massou, who he'd uh, known from the Algerian days and had his friendship with. And according to the reports, when he got, arrived there, he said, c'est foutu, Massu, it's, 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 it's buggered up, Massu. Uh, and Massu said, no, my general, um, uh, uh, there's always things you can do. And um, apparently the, the reports are contradictory as to whether he had his suitcases with him or not. But one theory is that he was, he was going to give it up and that Massu persuaded him to go back. The other theory is that he was the master of drama and that he, he, he created a dramatic vacuum and all around Paris that day, there were rumours as to where he was, what was going to happen, how the regime was going to collapse. And then he returned. Um, and he made a broadcast at 4.30, I think, the following day, um, in which he said he wasn't going to stand down. And he dissolved the National Assembly, and that's what really stopped the whole thing in its tracks. And it was partly uh, a dramatic act in 24 hours, a good Greek tragedy, I suppose, in a way. Um, and also dramatic in the sense that he used radio, not television, to make his broadcast, which took you back to the Algerian days. I mean, he used his sort of tenure history thing there. Um, and also his command of the, of, of, um, of the radio broadcast. It was a very dramatic sort of vacuum that day. Once he'd made that broadcast, there was a big demo organized on the right bank. And I'd never worked out whether that was, it must have been organized and not spontaneous, in which they complained about the students and denounced what had been taking place. And that's when really the, the pendulum began to swing back. And it swung back very, very quickly. The Sorbonne was opened up again. You remember the Sorbonne had been closed down, and the Sorbonne was opened up. The Sorbonne was a sight, actually, in those days, because when you went in, when the students occupied, it was a grand piano and jazz groups in the courtyard, and all sorts of left-wing groups having seminars in and around. It was a tremendous sort of, like a summer school, really, that was taking place, and, but that was opened up again in June. Yeah, so I've just got a, a question about memory. I mean... You know, particularly because it's such, it's become such a momentous historical event. I mean, can you separate what you remember from what you read about it afterwards, no. or what you read in the newspapers? And, and do you, you know, say, do you find ever come across letters or diaries from the time you read? It, and you're like, God, is that what I thought? Or you know, are things that you don't remember? Or do things suddenly come? You know, when you look at something on the television, does it spark a memory in your head that you forgot? But I just want to wonder, if, you know, if you the relation between memory and what happens and what, what you read? I think that's a very difficult one because you overlay your memory with all sorts of things, and especially being as old as I am, how far away it is. I mean, there's bound to be all sorts of kind of uh, bits of, um, of uh, transparency over what you're remembering. Um, I think, um, and also because I, t I taught that area too, I've had to structure it to teach it, and therefore I've sort of overlaying my memory with 
the, the printed record, I suppose. You remember the smells, but the smells are one thing you remember all the time. I can remember uh, screenshots in my eye of, of, of things that happened and of street scenes uh, that happened. I can remember the feelings, I think, of, uh, Jesus, is magnificent. I'm glad it's not my country, but I think it's magnificent what's taking place. Um, that sort of exhilaration. Um, as for following the whole political sequence, no. I mean, I was an avid Le Monde reader, and I still am. And Le Monde was pretty good at trying to put it into context in those days, but um, I wasn't good enough at French politics to understand all the niceties that have taken place. And I don't think a lot of it actually became comprehensible until afterwards, because a lot of it was still un underground. And so to that extent, you know, you're planting things on memory. But I think that's a real problem, isn't it, with any... Yeah. You know, as, as, to, as to whether I, because I, you know, I'm, I, I, that's just the way memory is. Yeah. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. So, well, I'm not, it wasn't, it's not a critical question yeah. for me. It's just, I'm just interested in how it works yeah. for, for you. I mean, yeah. so for instance, like if you went out and smelled tear gas, like with this. Oh, straight away. Yeah. yeah. That's not a, I mean, that's very distinctive. Yeah. yeah that's uh, interesting. And so is that just the kind of the one that you have the least control over is the smells, if you see what I, if you see what I mean. Well, it's all. Have you ever had it? It's uh, it's yeah, it's awful. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, your eyes, your nose, everything, oh, sinus. Yeah. 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 Oh, no, have you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can arrange that. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing I'm I'm quite interested in, um, Hugh, is this. I mean, you you came back to UCD. You started working in UCD yeah. whenever you came back, and so yeah. then you had this gentle revolution, yeah. as you as you're t saying. Did you bring back anything from from Paris in '68? I mean, how did I mean? There's a you know a lot of talk about how ideas travel and transnational and transnationalism, and you know, did you bring anything back in terms of ideas, in terms of techniques? Yes, I think I think the buzzword in those days was participation, okay. um, and it was this idea that uh, people working in institutions were locked out of the decision-making process. It had been a big feature in France, and it, it had its roots partly in, I suppose, uh, uh, syndicalist ideas, and also um, uh, various groups on the left who'd been arguing against the anonymity of industrial work and the anonymity of bureaucratic civilization. Um, and it became a buzzword in the, I think it was a buzzword in the UCD thing too, because it corresponded to the fact that the university was run top down and neither students nor junior staff had much say in, in what was going on. It was a very strongly, prof the, the God professor system mm. was uh, still very dominant in UCD, more so than in the UK at the time. Um, and so uh, professors, I remember, for example, and you know, you think this is trivial, but after the gender revolution, we had an argument about the need to put into our contracts. In those days, you had an annual contract. You didn't have a contract for life. It was an annual contract, but nobody had ever been sacked except for, I think, one alcoholic. <laughs> and so it, it was pretty well a, a life thing. And uh, there was a, an argument that we should have a proper contract like other universities had. So uh, they began drafting one. And the duty to do research was sort of written in. And a number of staff said, no, we don't want that in, because that'll mean the professor can tell us what to research on. Once it's in our contract to do research, the god professor will be able to say what you do. And at the moment, we can do research without it being in our contract, and the god professor can't tell us what to do, so we're independent. So um, there was that sort of um, wish for a, a participation and a more democratic um, form of university, I suppose. You see, you know, there wasn't really, I don't, I'll be shot down for this in the year that we are, but there wasn't really a revolutionary tradition in Ireland in the same way as in France. There's an insurrectionary tradition, but not a revolutionary tradition. Uh, the universities really, uh, Paddy will kill me for this, but on the whole, Irish universities have been incredibly conservative over the years. Uh, they've been, on the whole, the intellectual wing of the Fine Gael Party for, you know, for, for 20, 30, 40 years. And uh, so you didn't have that sort of student radicalism and, and um, uh, that tradition, I suppose. Did it change the way you kind of wrote your history, the historiography, or, you know, that, that generation, how did this... I mean, you, you went on to, to research and write about the French Revolution. Do you feel as though that your experiences in, in May of 1968 changed how you, you read that or changed perhaps that, that generation's way of, of reading you know, something like the French Revolution or the, or the Paris Commune? 
I mean, I think the thing had a, 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 a big influence on a lot of historians. Um, I think with me, actually, just made me think that France was really rather a wonderfully interesting country, and um, um, I really sort of fell in love with it after that, much to my wife's annoyance, but it's... Um, uh, it sort of confirmed me, I suppose, as a French historian. It made me realise that France is, is sti- and it still is a very historical culture, political culture. It's very aware of its history, um, and that has a, a big impact on it as well. So I think in those ways, in terms of actually my historical approach, I don't think it had a huge influence, but it did make me have to read um, all the left-wing theorists, um, you know, because you really had to work out how Marx differed from Trotsky, how... Trotsky um, differ from Bakunin's ideas that have become before. So you, you had to know your left-wing theology somewhat. Um. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, okay. um, this is a slightly obscure question, but in part 68, it's been cited by modern historians in particular as the, 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 you mentioned yourself in terms of the, use, the overturning of cars during demonstrations. The example of modern historians give of that is that that was a deliberate um, decision made by the protesters to tackle something that was visually very symbolic of capitalism. Would you agree with that or would you say it was more an opportunist? I think it's opportunist. I think it's building a barricade um, uh, and uh, more of that. Um, there, were, there were plenty of gestures against uh, capitalism. I did actually, I was, I'm very remiss, I did, I did have a number of these cartoons and you can't see them from back there. I mean, some of the cartoons in... Well, no, they're not cartoons, they're, they're posters in 1968, which were, many of them, done from a, a design school um, where they ran them off, are, are wonderful in their attacks on, on capitalism. Um, you know, if you like, it was a, You could do it with images and words more than you could by overturning cars, I think. And cars burn, that's their great advantage, too. <laughs> 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 uh, if frivolous theories are when I was 16 in school, I was forced, forced to uh, study Peg Sayers. <laughs> in France, in the 60s and 70s, for sure, uh, one of the books that was obligatory was Albert Camus. Camus. Yeah. And to look back and contrast the philosophy of those two books, I mean, yeah. were, was the cradle being rocked in France in a, by a different hand? Uh, oh, certainly than Ireland, yeah. I mean, Ireland in the late 60s was a very conservative traditional place, I think. No, I, I, I think so anyway. It was, uh, and it was very hierarchical in a way. It was a very, yeah. Uh, uh, and so many students lived at home anyway that um, there was a, a strong sort of cons- built-in conservatism in, in the place. Um, and the ideological element was much weaker in Ireland, I think, largely because it had been shut out um, you know, French students do philosophy in their final two years of school. Um, Irish students never have. And so there would have been a toolkit, I think, available in a French brain. It uh, would have been a primitive one, but it, w- it would certainly have been there. Yeah. One of the strands that you didn't mention, which might have led to a kind of quasi-revolutionary fervor in Dublin, was uh, the Vatican Council. I mean, that, as you already said, that UCD was dominated, or at least and a very large group of, of uh, seminary students. Yeah. Uh, but in Ireland, the church was very conservative, but also held some of the most radical thinkers. I mean, one of the most public radical thinkers was Fergal O'Connor, who mm-hmm. was uh, a staff member in UCD as well. Yeah. And the Vatican Council sort of opened up, I, I think, for a predominantly Catholic country, you know, where 99% of the students in UCD were Catholic. I mean, the fact that the Vatican Council throwing aside all, apparently all the old records, uh, despite what John Charles McRae might have said when he came back from Rome, uh, I, I think that was a strong trend in liberating or in making students, young people, see that there was a brighter future, you know, with brighter thinking. So, so that, I think that was a, a real trend that, that had an effect on, on young people's thinking. In, in, in yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to pick that one up, I don't think, because uh, not having a religion uh, and coming from outside, I just wouldn't have picked into that one at all, I suppose, um, yeah. We've got Connor and then Derry. And then... I, I, um, when I, when I, I started in UCD, I, mean, I consider myself now part of a, a, a generation that... Not that that experience no longer exists, but 
when, when a student signed up a decade ago for, um, for undergraduate history in UCD, he signed for history. But we all found out that what we actually learned in first year history was revolution. Because when we entered Theodore Rell, it was a year-long course, and it was yourself and Judith Devlin and Michael Laffin and Morris Brink, and you brought us through the four big revolutions, two of them social and two of them more capitalistic, uh, in the Russian, French, American and Irish revolutions. Um, and one of the things that, that you in particular, you know, seared into me while teaching you those things was the whole idea of the anarchy of the revolution and Crane Brinton's theories on revolution. Um, and whenever I look at revolutions and social movements, one of the things I always look out for is the counter-revolution mm-hmm. and the Thermidorian reaction. Yeah. And I wonder, do you have any sense that after, I, I know you left Paris almost as soon as, as the, the dust was beginning to settle, but did you get a sense in, maybe not Ireland, but particularly I mentioned in France here, did you get a sense of the counter-revolution that occurred in Paris or French society more generally um, after the, um, that, that carnival excitement of May 68 subsided? I don't think I'd have any. Um, I, I don't think I'd have any deep insights into it. To some extent, you know, somebody said earlier um, this feeling that you you hoped it would never end. You know that this was um, permanent, but you knew it would end because you knew that these things had happened before. Um, I think that there was a feeling, uh, certainly by about the twenty third, twenty fourth, when. Um, um, De Gaulle made a catastrophic speech, I think it was on the 24th of August, which was, and the, the stock exchange was set on fire, on the 24th of, um, of May, and the stock exchange was set on fire. Um, there was a feeling that, um, the, if you like, the momentum had been so huge that the right had stayed quiet and, you know, it was just there. But, but um, people didn't know, if you like, things had by now gone so far that even moderates were beginning to push themselves to the right because they just couldn't see any, any, any reasonable solution coming out. And once de Gaulle made that speech at the end of May, I think it's 29th or 30th of May, um, and the demonstration of something like 400,000 in the Champs-Élysées demonstrated support for him, it, it, it was very rapid the way in which the, the, the revolution collapsed. And it was partly because it was such a spontaneous event and... Uh, not totally unorganized, but it was very spontaneous, that it didn't have a strategy or a kind of end game um, to oppose to de Gaulle's proposal of dissolving the National Assembly and returning the whole thing back to normal um, politics. So um, I think it was quite evident in the first two weeks. I was there until late July when the election results came in, uh, and uh, the collapse was very quick there. And it was just a feeling of a balloon deflating, um, really, uh, very quickly. Last question for Dorian. Um, you've been to Paris to view archival materials. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I couldn't get there. They closed. They closed on the. They closed on the seventh of May, and the Bibliothèque Nationale closed. Um, everything closed down. Um, uh, you see, general strikes began on the thirteenth of May. That's w- uh, when. That's when the workers came out. Uh, everything was closed. I mean, uh, the metro still worked. No, it didn't. The metro stopped as well. We walked into the city centre. Um, so everything was just dead. Um, when did things start reopening then? They really began to reopen. Well, you see, the, the broadcast, the television stations closed down and the radio closed down as well because they were on strike too. So you, you really were deprived. You, foreign radios is all you had. Um, the, um, the return to work began just after the goals broadcast, end of May, early, early June, sort of a gradual sort of trickle back to work then. So it, it, was a, it, was a, it was an eerie sort of um, sign. You could get cigarettes and you could get basics, but um, uh, that was about all. <laughs>